next talk coming up. It's a very common topic, hypertension. Almost all of us may need to manage it at some time. And for that, uh, for the next presentation, may I invite Dr. Tiny Nair. He, he needs no introduction, actually, in, in Kerala. Um, so he's the professor and uh, head of department of PRS Hospital Cardiology. He has many accolades. He won the Best Doctor Award in 2006, Government of Kerala. Most Inspiring Doctor from Economic Times 2019. Best Reviewer and Annals of Venal Medicine. And he's in the editorial board of multiple acclaimed journals. He's a very good orator, writes very well. <laughs> many articles with a touch of humor. So please uh, welcome Dr. Tiny Nair. Please, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, thank you. Just to make sure that everybody is uh, awake and live. Uh, so the topic is hypertension management status 2023. Uh, uh, we'll try to quickly go through whatever new status has come in 2023 that would be useful for us in tomorrow morning's practice as we see the next patient. But then first understand that the end of hypertension is almost is in sight, right? The end of hypertension is almost in sight. If you think I'm joking, uh, Zilebisiran, this is just 10 days back, July 20, any jam. Zilebisiran is an RNA interference therapeutic agent given as one single injection to 107 patients. First eight weeks follow-up, all of them had normal blood pressure. 24 weeks follow-up, excellent results. Hypertension gone. In fact, NEGM has given an editorial on silencing angiotensinogen in hypertension. So time is not too far when we would go to the hospital, get one injection of uh, Zilabisiran or similar kind of stuff, go home, no medicine, nothing, hypertension is gone. But since that comes in, let us focus on something that is practical, right? Uh, status 2023, we know how to measure blood pressure. This figure everybody has seen, right? Should make the patient comfortable, music, uh, uh, should not have coffee, should not be angry with you and all that. It raises blood pressure, but just then. See, ACC, AHA, ESC, everybody focus on this kind of stuff. Back should be supported for the patient as we check the blood pressure. Feet should be on the ground. Arm should be supported. But what is new is, in the new publication of ACC, AHA, they have showed how much difference is made. And if you see that, you'd realize how wrong do we go. For example, back support, a proctored back support of your patient when you're checking the blood pressure, reduces BP by six millimeters. A foot placed on the floor rather than dangling from his bed, eight millimeters. And if the arm is like this, you know, the hydrostatic pressure also adds up to the blood pressure and it may go as high as 10 millimeters. So imagine that if you just support the arm and properly take the BP, it might be 10 millimeters less. And this is new, ACCH has given these numbers, so make sure that the back is supported, foot is firmly on the ground, and the arm is supported, and you do proper, proper thing. You've already seen that mercury problem, right? So mercury is out, it's an environmental toxin, so we have choice between aneroid and we have on, and the automated. Automated is an oscillatory instrument, so understand that, uh, you know, the, the automated oscillometric instrument is uh, it does not measure with a correct of sound. So, so our choices are two, right? So we are left with aneroid and an automatic. Now we should know the difference. If you look at that graph, that is the pressure going up and pressure coming down in a standard automated BP instrument. And if you look at that correct of sound, right? This is standard method we all check with that aneroid. Okay, inflate, deflate, listen to the sound. So the correct of sound starts there, disappears there. One, five, right? Let us draw a line at both the ends. Now, if you compare that with the automated instruments, which is an oscillometric one, it doesn't look at sounds, right? Many people think that it picks up sound. No, it doesn't. So it's an oscillometric method where it picks up the largest oscillation at the center. And the algorithm goes down by 50% to predict a systolic pressure, goes down by 70% and of that total height, and gives you the diastolic pressure. Now, if you that way, look at systolic and diastolic. They're different from the sound that you hear, right? In fact, the, 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 the oscillatory automated BP apparatus senses the systolic blood pressure slightly higher and gives you a slightly lower diastolic pressure. So your automated gives a slightly higher systolic and a slightly lower diastolic. So the point is, don't get upset when the patient says, Sar, Sar, Indale, Marina, Kodute, Ganyan, BP, Nokum, Parthage, 140 by 62. Sar, Jan, Ellam, Nirti. Tell him that don't look at diastole, look at systole fine, and it should be all right as long as it doesn't come down to 110 or 100, but then it should be okay. So the point is that 
understand that there's an algorithm by the automated instrument. So when you look at an algorithm, it senses as a diamond, and that's why it is generally, unless you buy a top-end instrument, invalid in the presence of irregular heartbeat. So an automated does not show you correct blood pressure when there's an atrial fibrillation, excepting the very top-end ones which we use in research. So aneroid compared to automated, automated gives a slightly higher systolic, slightly lower diastole, but that is the gold standard now, right? Don't worry, that's the gold standard now. Second is, many people don't understand that hypertension is more known by the company it keeps. You know, what are we talking about? Let's say somebody has pre-diabetes. What is pre-diabetes? Everybody knows. Fasting sugar, 110 to 123 IFG, right? We tell them, hey, be careful. Tomorrow you might become diabetic. You are an IFG, you are a pre-diabetic. Let us say we have somebody who has a pre-hypertension. Blood pressure between 120 and 140. Hey, you have borderline BP and any salt, right? But what we don't realize is that if you have a combination of pre-hypertension plus pre-diabetic, and if you look at the cardiovascular disease incidence, see that hazard ratio of CV disease, it is at 6.1. So we are not talking about becoming a hypertensive, becoming a diabetic in future. We are talking about very high incidence of cardiovascular disease. So if you have somebody who is pre-hypertensive or pre-diabetic, make sure that he takes treatment because the hazard ratios are very, very high. Right. So that what we are talking about is when somebody has a hypertension sitting like that, looks very comfortable, right? He has, if he has associated diabetes, smoking, obesity, or in high LDL, he is actually there, right? So we need to keep our eyes open for a bigger picture when hypertension is associated with bad friends and bad associates, right? That is point number two. See, everybody knows that now we have shifted onto the, the ambulatory blood pressure. Why? Because patient one no, anche minute, cut no, sister daughter no, BP no, okay, 160 over 95. That has no value, right? He might be angry, he might be angry, he might have taken coffee, he might have waited outside your OPD for one hour, he is already angry with you and all that. So BP is not right. So we are looking at 24-hour BP. Of all that BP, one that I would accept as the best parameter, if available, would be nocturnal BP. Why? Look at that graph. So in this graph, we see the x-axis is systolic blood pressure. What? 90, 100, 200, 230. On the y-axis, we have mortality. Risk, which is cardiovascular death, very hard in point, right? Now look at the first lowest graph, which is the office BP, office BP, right? And say my patient's blood pressure is what, 120. So see, this risk is what, near one, huh? near one. If now he suddenly develops severe hypertension, blood pressure going to 170, his risk has gone up, but how much? Very little, right? In contrast, if that 170 was his nighttime BP, look at that his risk could have gone to what? Three times higher. That's why, as a cardiologist, we said, if you give me one blood pressure parameter to say that will this patient develop problem, that would be a nocturnal blood pressure. In fact, there are a lot of studies. For example, this is one of those ambulatory blood pressure measurements. This is one of the studies we did about a dozen of our colleagues were there all over India. And this had 27,472 patients. Very meticulously done study. Every patient's data was uploaded automatically to the server. There's no chance of data missing. This is called the India IBPM study. It turned out to be one of the largest IBPM database in India. In fact, the world. Today, we are respected when we go outside. And, oh, you did that India IBPM study, right? And that showed masked hypertension in 20% patients. Mass means daytime BP near normal. But nighttime BP high. So when the patient comes to your hospital, BP, ah, well, you call it 140, 90, but entire night his blood pressure is high. And we said, what? Nocturnal blood pressure is the most important step. In fact, this is one of our articles in 2019 where we said that uh, nocturnal blood pressure looks like connected to dementia. Dementia. We'll show you a more on nocturnal BP. See, if you look at the green line is systole, the orange line is diastole, it's a 24 hour blood pressure light. That is daytime, and this is the systolic blood pressure. See, daytime BP, near normal, right? Hovering near that straight line. While if you look at the nighttime, the blood pressure is high. This is typical of masked nocturnal hypertension, right? Now, understand that the daytime BP is always overwhelmed by sympathetic system. Now I'm talking to you, my sympathetic system is active. Those who are not sleeping there, sympathetic is active because you're trying to imbibe what is it. But at night, when we go home, go to bed, sympathetic slowly comes down. Doesn't go away, but comes down. That heightened sympathetic activity comes down, we go to sleep, and then what takes over or what remains is renin-angiotensin system. Right, so the night BP basically 
tells us about renin angiotensin system activity, which at a very early stage is upregulated in diabetes. In fact, we have data today, this is the DACO data, which quickly we'll go through that, shows that in this category of night blood pressure elevated, masked hypertension, with type 2 diabetes, the highest cardiovascular event rate. Right. So the question is, so what do we do? Do we catch hold of every hypertension doing a ambulatory blood pressure? It's not possible, right? Only few hospitals has it, it's expensive, it's not possible. So what do we do? This is most important. So if we give a short acting medication to my patient, to our patient, see the night blood pressure is still high. So as far as possible, give your patient a long acting medicine, whatever you choose. So that whether he has night hypertension or not, it will be covered. And 20% of our patients have nocturnal hypertension, mass hypertension. So use a long-acting medicine. All that we are trying to say is that if you are using an ACE inhibitor, try to use parendopril because it's longest acting. If you're using a diuretic, use chlorothalidone or indapamide, longest acting. If you're using a calcium antagonist, use amlodipine, which is the longest acting. If you're using a beta blocker, use either nebivolol or, or bisoprolol, which is longest acting. So use a long-acting drug. This is another status report of 2023. Finally, very important, which we don't realize, is something called a speed check. What is speed check? So this data on heart rate and hypertension, 15,000 patients of a trial called value trial. They were looking something else, but they looked at different heart rates, 50, 80, 70, different heart rates. And this is what they found. A group of patients who had blood pressure well controlled, heart rate controlled, they did the best. Now, a group of patients who had a heart rate which is uncontrolled, but BP controlled, BP controlled. They didn't do well at all. Their outcome was bad. And when they took out those patients who had a heart rate of 80 from this subgroup, they found that their endpoints were bad. Primary endpoint, 1.6 times higher, heart failure, 2.2 times higher, MI, 1.5, sudden cardiac death, 1.6 times higher. So heart rate needs to be controlled. Why are we talking about heart rate? Because when we did Another study called India Heart Study, again, 20 of our colleagues were there all over India. When we published that data, 18,000 patients, we found that compared to Westerners, Indian patients' heart rate is faster, 83 beats per minute. More than 80, right? So Indians basically, maybe we are go-getters, maybe like Dr. Arun said, we all are fighting to strive and become better. Our heart rate is faster. So we need to control heart rate whether to give beta blocker, whether to give them uh, coaching, whether to tell them not to get burnt out is different, right? Finally, before we end, trajectory, what we call a lady special. This is extremely important for us to understand in clinical practice. This is new trajectory of midlife women. See, if we look at blood pressure patterns in women, and that is the blood pressure level, we put a straight line at menopause, right? We find three distinct patterns. On the top, we find a group where we call them high, slow decline. Which means their blood pressure is high, but after menopause, it tends to slightly decline. High decline. Second group, constantly rising. We call them medium linear rise. Look at that. Progressively rising. And a third group, we call them low accelerated rise. Now, this is important. Their blood pressure was normal before, but after menopause, it rises. And that is an important group. So if you look at the sum and summary of this, menopause is straight there. You see this particular group where... Blood pressure was normal, right after menopause it went up, has the highest cardiovascular event rate. This is something we didn't know about, right? So a lady whose blood pressure says, irreversible are normal, I may prove, right after menopause my blood pressure has shot up, has the highest cardiovascular risk, they can be identified, at a, they have a younger age of menopause, early vasomotor symptoms, so-called so many things. Finally, last thing, last thing, this is the article which wrote about un underrated subsets in India, what is it? When we see an elderly patient, what is their blood pressure like? Isolated systolic hypertension. People who are above 75, their blood pressures are like 160, 170 systole. The other diastole would be 70, right? Isolated systolic hypertension. They are not very easy to treat. You try to treat them, diastole comes down, they might feel giddy, they might feel whatever it is, right? Isolated systolic hypertension. But today, we see a different group. And again, understand this is the first time described only from India. Isolated systolic hypertension of the young. These are people working in Technopark, Youngsters, they work at night, highly stressed out, but they have a six, seven, significantly elevated systolic blood pressure. Diastole is normal. We call them ISHY. In fact, we wrote an article on ISHY talking about the blood pressure going from father to son, right? Father to son, and that is the challenge. So isolated systolic hypertension of the young, don't forget, they're age less than 40, IT professionals, highly stressed out. 
The moment they come to your clinic, they have tachycardia. Cell phones are ringing. You can make out that the boy is so stressed out. Isolated systolic hypertension, nocturnal diastolic blood pressure is normal. They have tachycardia, they have stress and anxiety, and they get good symptom relief with beta blocking. So at the end, in conclusion, where are we? Sum and summary of status 2023 new developments in hypertension is one, choose the right gadget, oscillometric. Choose the right way of measurement. Point number two, nocturnal blood pressure is a very sensitive predictor of long-term outcome. So if you have the way and measure to do, do an ambulatory blood pressure and get a nocturnal blood pressure assessment. If you can't do, don't worry. Treat your patient with a long-acting drug. Never use a short-acting because 20% of your patients, our patients in daily practice might have something called a masked hypertension. Right, use a long-acting medication. Heart rate is extremely important. So if your blood pressure instrument shows heart rate of 95, blood pressure is controlled, don't be happy. Think there is something. He may be nervous when he meets you, but if constantly the heart rate is high, it's a bad sign. Today, everybody at home has a pulse oximeter. Ask them to monitor at home and tell you about the, about the heart rate. Postmenopausal women, rise of blood pressure after menopause is a distinct risk factor. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, sir. We have time for a few questions. Um, very different take on hypertension and very practical points. Any, any questions? Nice to see you, Dr. Uh, just one query. <coughs> At the second half of uh, June 2022, there was one article published in European Society of Hypertension focusing only on how to record VPI, seven or eight pages. And one of the points which was stressed was the validated, calibrated VPI per test. Mercury, they said it is because of heart, but I have my own concern regarding that, whether it's applicable in the Indian Kerala setup. Whether a digital manometer, they said, it has to be properly validated by a standard protocol by a competent authority. Okay. And unfortunately, the article says, only about 10% of the apparatus available in the world is properly validated and that be much less. Now in Kerala or India, the pollution due to other things are million times more than due to mercury. Mercury leakage, the previous X-ray also decay is there, but I think health hazard related to mercury, one of the European standard set is mercury hazard and take it away. But I have my own doubt whether you must remove mercury and replace with the automated digital manometer, which is producing lot of errors. Lot of errors. I have checked many apparatus. Yeah, and yeah. this article it, highly correct. emphasizes it, that it, point. It is very well taken. But the point is that worldwide, 99% of the countries have taken an oath that they will not allow anything mercury, including thermometer, including manometer. So whether we fight or not, mercury is gone, right? We won't be able to get mercury instruments anymore because it's in, uh, you know, and if you remember that uh, Kumamoto incidents in Japan where one industry was pouring a little bit of mercury into the bay and people who drank it had the Kumamoto disease that took one decade for diagnosis, right? People were dying out of so many toxicities unknowingly. But anyway, the point is mercury won't be available anyway, anywhere in the world. And it's been banned as a pollutant. So we have choice between aneroid and automated it is better to shift on to automated oscillometric, despite the point that there may be. We can tell the patient that uh, buy one which is validated by ESC or an EC, mark on that, and then uh, that are likely to be. But again, it's an electronic instrument, it might go wrong. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Very high mortality on follow up. I think uh, uh, it is entirely true because just as the nocturnal hypertension is the culprit, the postprandial blood sugar is the culprit. The rice produces endothelial dysfunction, not the fasting. It is the postprandial blood sugar rice which actually produces endothelial damage and uh, uh, all the uh, um, uh, cascade of uh, bad absolutely, events. Absolutely. That is number one. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Uh, the second thing is that uh, whenever you are in doubt, we have so many patients BP is absolutely no, normal, but uh, they are actually hi hypertensive, maybe masked hypertension. You do an echocardiogram, you find evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. You see the fundus, there is evidence of uh, 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 hypertensive retinopathy. So, end organ dam or the kidney 
microabnuria or the abnormal creatinine so i think uh, uh, these are uh, when you fi find any of these end organ damage normal bp you should suspect mass hypertension correct, correct. and maybe do an abpm and then treat them aggressively so i think professor titus has highlighted on two things very important one is low level multiple risk factors this is what we see in kerala right after an acute mi the person would sit up in bed 45 years he would say sare eniki onnum illa eniki cholesterol illa sugar illa bp illa njan ennum check cheyum njan ennum gym il poi odum sar eniki endu konde mi adichu check it out they might have pre hypertension their hb ones will be just maybe creeping up to 6.2 look at the lipids the ldl would be 110 right they're all abnormal to the patient it is normal to us it is all abnormal low level multiple risk factor is the i believe is the sole and the main driver of young mis in kerala number one and second thing is exactly like you said can we do abpm for everyone no but the criteria is if you see there's a discordance between your measured bp and the target organ damage for example a young person comes oru target organ damage la kannu normal mi onnu illa his blood pressure is 180 by uh, 80 you tell hey it is a white coat hypertension i will do an ambulatory bp it will be normal in contrast somebody like professor titus said comes he is normal 140 95 bp echo bhayankar lvh urine microalbumin kanine ophthalmologist for you the retinal hypertensive change under that is a person who needs an ambulatory bp because he has most likely mass hypertension thank you thank you so, thank so you much sir, sir.